From procrastination to perfectionism to living off nothing but caffeine and creativity, these are the six painfully obvious signs that you just might be a writer at heart. Hey Posse, what's up? It's Alex coming at you this week with a video made just for you, all you self-identified writers, wordsmiths, and phrase slayers out there. Give me a thumbs up below to let me know you're here. And if you're new to the crew, welcome. I put out a new copywriting and marketing tutorial every single week. So if you wanna learn more about the hottest conversion trends that are working today, go ahead and subscribe below and don't forget to ring that bell to be notified when my next tutorial goes live. Now let's dive in, shall we? No matter which genre your writing belongs to, copy, content, affiliate marketing, novelist, poet, or journalist, there are just some things that we as writers all share in common. And isn't that kind of refreshing to know? I mean, think about it. As a writer, we don't typically know many other writers on a personal level, especially when we're just starting out. Sure, we like, follow, subscribe, and study the work of other writers and creators that we look up to, but when it comes to real life, face-to-face -face interaction with our writing peers, we usually have little to none. We are a rare breed and that can be an isolating feeling, often leaving us to wonder, am I doing this right? Is this really the path for me? Am I cut out for this whole writing thing? Well, if you find yourself saying F yeah to any of these habits, it is pretty clear that you are in fact a writer at heart and you belong right here inside the copy posse. Sign number one, we read a lot. So you've probably heard this one before, the best writers in the world read a lot. I like to dedicate my Fridays to honing my craft by reading, studying, and practicing new skills, a habit I adopted in my early career working at Mind Valley. But no, that doesn't mean that we writers only read educational books, non-fictions, and memoirs. We also love a good novel, a captivating fantasy, a clever poem, and even a cheeky Cosmo mag from time to time, which I'm being honest is definitely my guilty pleasure. So what's the deal? Why do we as writers like to read so much? Well, there are a number of benefits associated with reading. People who read more tend to have lower levels of stress, think more critically and have a sharper memory. We're more likely to vote, exercise, be more cultural, and studies show that reading actually expands our vocab. So whether you're pouring through Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace or scanning through an academic journal, you're probably gonna come across a word or two that you've never seen before. Which is a pretty huge advantage for us writers. But what makes us different from other hobby readers is that when we find a word or expression that we're not sure of, we almost always write it down or do a quick Google search to connect the dots. Have you ever done that? <laughs> it leads us to that aha moment of clarity, adding another word to our subconscious memory bank and ultimately making us better writers. In this case, curiosity keeps the cat empathetic, sharp, and refreshingly expressive. Number two, we're always taking notes. So if you're a writer, you probably need to hear this. You do not need to buy another notebook. Use the blank ones you have on your bookshelf first. If you were to look through the journal of a writer, because yes, we all have at least one, what you would probably see is a hodgepodge of messy scribbles, phrases, ideas, and sketches. Now to the untrained eye, this might seem chaotic and incoherent, but to us writers, these notes are the lifeblood of our work. They are gold. They contain some of the most creative thoughts and ideas we have. It is rare that we think of winning taglines, phrases or plots when we're actually sitting down at our computers and working because that would be too easy. Most of the time our genius ideas come to us during pretty inconvenient moments like when we're showering or sitting on an airplane. And because the mind of a writer is usually thinking approximately 8 million things at once, if we don't write these thoughts down immediately, we risk losing that idea forever. Every single product, launch, or sales page that I've ever created started in a notebook, and I have all the messy notes and scribbles to prove it. Now, what if your creative juices start flowing when you're driving or you're in a situation where you actually can't take notes? I love to make voice memos during these moments to make sure that I capture my idea in all of its glory before it's gone. All right, number three, we're too hard on ourselves, also known as imposter syndrome, that dreaded gut-wrenching feeling that you have no freaking clue what you're talking about or what you're doing, but everyone else looks at you like you're an expert and have it all figured out, which leaves you feeling like a straight up phony baloney that will soon be exposed for a fake and a fraud. 
Yeah, it's absolutely terrifying, but it's also complete fiction, just like the novel on your bedside table. It is estimated that approximately 70% of people experience imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. But for writers, imposter syndrome is a real bee that never really goes away. She's not like that annoying aunt that you only have to deal with once a year on Christmas. She's more like that drill sergeant boss who hounds you for making her coffee wrong every single morning. She just won't leave us alone. But here's the thing guys, imposter syndrome is bound to pop up anytime you're stepping outside your comfort zone, which happens a lot when you're a writer who is constantly growing, improving, and putting your creative work out there to be judged, viewed, and critiqued. Because the more you grow, the bigger your goals get, and the bigger your goals get, the more you have to lean into the fear of the unknown. It is scary, yes, but like Tori Burch says, if it doesn't scare you, you're probably not dreaming big enough. So lean in, feel the fear, and do it anyway. What have you gotta lose? Okay, so I went off on a little bit of a rant there, but I really wanna make sure that all my fellow writers out there really understand that imposter syndrome is normal, and you should feel comfort in knowing that we all feel her wrath from time to time. And speaking of comfort, that brings me to number four on the list, we can be seclusive. So have you ever noticed that when a writer is in creative flow, you don't notice them at all? And that's because that we as writers do our best work in private seclusion. We write best when we're huddled away with our headphones on and our fingers typing a million words a minute. Writers are notorious for zoning out for hours, days, weeks, or sometimes even months on end. Hey, when the creative juice is flowing, we don't dare stop it sometimes not even to eat. This can come off as a bit antisocial at times, and actually some of the most successful writers of all time were famous for their hermit-like natures. I mean, Emily Dickinson didn't leave her family property for at least two decades of her life. Talk about extreme. And Harper Lee, the author of the American classic To Kill a Mockingbird, was once asked to address the Alabama Academy of Honor, which she denied saying that it's better to be silent than to be a fool. Well played, Harper, well played. While there are many authors similar in nature to Dickinson and Harper, it wouldn't be fair to say that all writers fall into that extremist category. Yes, we like to work in isolation and away from distractions, but outside of work, writers are real people too. We still crave and benefit social interaction, connection, and community. Actually, it's downright necessary to keep us sane and inspired, which brings me to sign number five, we think too much. If writers had a superpower, it would definitely be our tenacious ability to analyze anything and everything to a million pieces. And sometimes this actually feels more like a curse than a superpower. Our minds are constantly racing, and when we're not busy thinking up fresh projects and creative ideas, we're observing and analyzing everything around us. We're the ones in movie theaters. Remember when you used to actually go to movies in theaters pre-pandemic? <laughs> we're the ones in movie theaters that when the entire crowd laughs or cries at a particular scene, we're sitting there wondering, hmm, what made this crowd of completely different people feel the same emotion at the exact same time. Writers absolutely love observing our fellow humans in this way because it helps us better understand people and what makes them tick. But the real golden nugget is that this analytical habit ultimately leads to better empathy. And empathy is an art that must be mastered by all good writers. It's how we're able to connect and understand with our readers, the characters we describe, and the clients we write for. Understanding the diverse motivations that drive people to do what they do takes great attention to detail, which means that we as writers are always tapped in, tuned in, observing, and relating. But not in a creepy way, more in like we actually give a damn kind of way. <laughs> All right, number six, we love emojis. Remember when emojis were limited to just keyboard symbols? <laughs> Those were the good old days. The first emoji wasn't actually created until 1999 by a coder in Japan. And it wasn't until 2010 that emojis were made available outside of Japan, which is insane because fast forward to now and we're surrounded by a smorgasbord of choices in our communication platforms. In fact, over 3,500 emojis exist to be exact. There is an emoji for everything, to express your every emotion, to represent your favorite food, and even to give your friends a virtual fist bump. Or should I say, and we as writers love them. We use emojis when we're texting friends, sending emails, and even when we're writing copy. Why? Because emojis bring the depth and flavor of our written word to a whole new level when used the right way, of course. Studies indicate that emojis are a form of communication that is just as real as words. Emojis basically act as visual representations of the body language and facial expressions that we would display if we were having a conversation face to face. They can provide warmth, dimension and relatability to an otherwise lackluster message. And let's be honest, sometimes even writers can't find the perfect word to effectively communicate what's going on inside our hearts. I mean, what's the point of spelling out wink wink when a simple will get the message across perfectly? Or when you're really ticked off and I'm so mad it just doesn't have the same effect as 
but like anything there's a time and a place for emojis and they can be overdone so make sure you're using them properly and effectively and there you have it guys six painfully obvious signs that you're a writer at heart so how many of these apply to you drop a comment below and let me know and if you want to see more videos about the life of a writer check out my video on a day in the life of a copywriter the pandemic edition you can watch that right here as always thank you so much for watching and subscribing I will see you next week with a brand new video until then I'm Alex ciao for now no matter which genre, genre, genre. <laughs>